It's not just the TikTok and all the other different pieces that are coming up. Five second video that makes life meaningful. What actually makes life meaningful for a lot of people are the relationships we have rather than the things that we've you know, accomplished. It actually doesn't matter how much you plan into the future because tomorrow is not promised. I think I've, I've kind of like existentially had like a crisis when I first like lost an eye myself because I think it really painted the picture of, you know, I could go fully blind. It actually instilled a lot of gratitude in me and a lot of appreciation for the world itself. And today we are joined by a very special guest. Go ahead and introduce yourself, special guest. Special guest Kevin Jones here <laughs> in the <laughs> house. house. Exactly, I do. I do it. <laughs> yeah, thanks for joining us today, Kevin. Honestly, it's been, um, I, I'll be honest, you were one of the first people when we were talking about guests that were like, we got to get this guy on because it's, it's going to be a dope experience. And so we know Kevin from our work in the field of mental health as well. Uh, and we've got, gotten to have a lot of different conversations. And when I say different, I would say that Kevin is one of those people who, similarly to Uriel and I, he's willing to have discussions about things that most other people would shy or cringe away from. And this man's dry wit is unmatched. And so it, it always makes for some interesting revelations, shall we say, in, in the way that the, the conversations go. And so true to form, when we have guests, we have this game, Close, Closer, Closest, that essentially gives us cards that are at three different levels of intimacy in terms of questions that they'll be asking. And so we'll go ahead and let Kevin pick the first one. And then we'll, of course, all answer the question as well. Go ahead and draw, my man. Okay, here we go. Now I knew it. Of course, it's going to be close. Let's go to the closest. We're here anyway. Let's see. Want me to read this out? Go ahead, man. Excellent. What's the nicest thing anyone has done for you? We did that one. With yeah, Christine. yeah, we got oh, that one with Chris. Let's pull another one. Yeah, redraw, Come on. redraw. How many guys did, you got did, I, did I shuffle? No, I did not you shuffle. Did. I literally just stuck it back at the end. What are the odds, though? I don't know. Okay. Well, if you don't shuffle, it's 100%. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. It's starting. I like it. Uh, have you ever stolen anything? <laughs> is the question here. Getting... All right. Oh, this is good. Should I we get Kevin to answer that. first? Of course. <laughs> the guest always answers first. Ooh, have I ever stole anything besides the hearts of your viewers? Yeah, this <laughs> hard, hard to say. Uh, let me think here. No, I I can't think of anything that I've really stolen. No, no five burger discounts over here. That is impressive. Good for you, Uriel. Go ahead. Uh, I can't say I've been that gracious in my life. Definitely, I was influenced uh, one time when I was a kid. Just uh, yeah. Do a little five finger discount on a chocolate bar. One time, eh? Yeah, only once actually, because I got caught. Oh yeah. And then my parents took me to the store. Yeah. To I, apologize, I, I, I and apologize. I have to pay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I will say that uh, the answer is yes, and I'm just leaving it at that. Okay. <laughs> no, actually, your thing it reminds me of something. I think when I was about five years old, I walked yeah. out with a Ninja Turtle. Oh, oh. Okay. Okay. mom was like, none of this. Run Which back. one, though? Do you remember? Oh, I don't know. But yeah, the little plastic. Yeah, 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 those guys. Yeah. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. All yeah. about that when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Take my age what you will based on that, I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Secret. Yeah, mine uh, was people from school would talk about it all the time. And like one time I wanted, I wanted one. My parents said no. So I grabbed it. And then my, like my dad saw me do it. Oh, no. Way. Like he let me take it. And then oh. put me through the whole thing of like after we left the store to come back and like explain everything to the store owner. Yeah, he and taught like you a good lesson. Put me through the lesson of, yeah, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> yeah, I remember this, a similar story. I think it's funny. It's always seems to be candy or toys that yeah. most most uh, kids do. And so for me, it Tempting. was like uh, a little gobble, <laughs> gobble bump, a bubble gum. It was Hubble Bubba actually. Oh, actually well, that stuff Slipped it in my brother's amazing. coat. And my mom, same thing, straight up saw Waited until we got through the checkout because it was at the checkout. And then she was like, yeah, you're going to go up and tell them that you took this. And the reason I was taken is I was all excited that my mom finally bought us a Nintendo 64 after months of say no forever. Yeah. And because of that, we had to delay being able to open it for an entire week. So after waiting months, yeah. agonizing for this N64, my poor decision making further delayed something that I had been anticipating for a long time. So it was a good lesson. Nice. All right, Kevin. Okay. Number two. Card two. Oh, of course. Yeah. Just go middle of the deck here. Yeah, I like it. There you Just go. Because we know the shuffling's not up to par. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard that. 
Let's see what we got here. What is the biggest lie you have ever told? Ah, uh, lying and stealing, eh? <laughs> All right. Wow. You already want to go first this time? I got to think about it a little bit. Yeah, go yeah, yeah this is a hard one. To, That's a hard one. Yeah. Biggest. Oh. Yeah, I I think that without saying too much, because I it, there's a whole story behind this and uh, the, the whole context is required to to give the full picture. But I will say that when I was younger, I was less, let's say, less honest when it came to relationships in general. And I would say I learned some painful lessons because of that. But before I reformed my ways, I would say that there was this uh, one girl that was under the assumption that her and I were dating. And in order to receive a gift for my birthday, I permitted that uh, to go on longer than it should have because I was really intent on getting this gift and say, (laughs) <laughs> definitely, definitely not one of my finest moments, I would say. And I learned some very painful lessons around relationships and deceit to mm-hmm. mount that. And that, that's why I believe that karma always has a way to balance things out because, uh, yeah, I made sure that after that I refrained from that. So it, it, that's all I'm going to say. In terms of the gift, was uh, are we up to GameCube at that point? What was <laughs> yeah. this was This was 10th grade. It was... Final Fantasy 13. It was a video, it was a video oh, game. My gosh. Yeah, yeah, because yo, was, PlayStation games were expensive. Man. Man. I, I, like, and even more so now, it was 70 bucks. I wasn't working. I was 15. I didn't have that type of money. Man, you played the girl, you played the game. What is going on? <laughs> <laughs> it started already it rough. Me. Yeah, it was rough. It wasn't good. It was not my finest moment. Fair enough. Wow. Let's see. Uh, there was a table at a place that I worked at, and I kind of like put my foot up. Put it down on the table. The heel went right through. No. I was like, oh, man. It was like kind of a kind of a cheap table. I was like, oh, man. I don't know what to do in this situation. And then uh, one of the bosses came through and they asked me, you know, you know what happened to this table? I'm like, I have no clue. I In the moment, I'm just like, I don't know. Uh, but that was when I was like, yeah, probably about 18, 19, somewhere in there. And I'm yeah. just like, ah. But, yeah. you know. If I, looking back on it, I, I wish I would have taken some responsibility. Be like, you know, it was me. I could pay for the table or whatever. But uh, in that moment, I was just like, ah, oh, just the shame of it. Yeah. With shame, yeah. you want to hide. And that's kind of what I did in that moment. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that. I think for me was when I was in grade seven, um, we had a an English teacher that like everybody hated. They, they were filling in uh, and something for our main teacher. And I don't remember why they were off. But um all of the kids in our class were like just awful to this sub. And um, three of the kids, like they left their purse in the classroom when we were uh, during recess and they took like all the money from that teacher's wallet. (laughs) And like, I saw them do it. And uh, obviously the teacher found out later in the day and there was this huge deal. And the whole school was like asking anybody if they knew. and. yeah, they asked me if I knew anything or had seen anything because they went, like, they literally talked to every single one of us in the classroom individually. Um, and yeah, I never said anything. And I said I didn't know anything. And, and honestly, to this day, now, I, it still, like, hurts my heart because that teacher was, like, bawling. And uh, nobody ever got in trouble for that. Yeah, that's rough. Yeah. Yeah, you never know people's situations. And when you hear things like that, and she, you would think, oh, yeah, you know, she can just go get more but yeah it's it's never that simple right yeah and yeah. that's the context that you lack as a child and sometimes i think back to and i'm like yeah if only i had none i had known better i would have done better but hey that's, yeah. the, that's the benefit of hindsight right and being yeah. able to apply things going forward yeah and it's funny because like all the kids that did it they started like bribing people and giving people money so they wouldn't say anything and i i, I didn't take any money because i was like yo i want nothing to do with this yeah, and like if you guys get caught then i get associated with you guys so it was like but yeah uh, she was, she was, I don't know. I thought she was nice. Yeah. I was like one of the few people that thought she was cool, but. At least you had that wisdom. Yeah. The, yeah, the accomplice of a thief is bound. He dare not testify. We wanted to have a conversation about a interesting topic that Kevin brought forward. That is something that I personally hadn't really thought about previously. And that's this idea of how we can actually leverage death as a positive, constructive force in our lives. Now, Kevin, I'd be interested in hearing from you. Why is this something that you were interested in talking about? And how did you actually begin conceptualizing this idea that death can actually be used for positive things? 
Well, I, I think it's just interesting here, you know, in Western society, we have so many euthanisms about death. We feel so uncomfortable about how we talk about the end of our life for something that's going to happen to all of us eventually, right? So a lot of times people shy away from it. So, you know, you think uh, cliches of like, oh, the dog's just gone out to a farm or, you know, uh, grandma bought the farm, right? And what do those things actually mean? Well, they keep us, you know, a little bit away from what it actually means to be human, I think, when we're looking at death as a whole. So um, obviously working in mental health, I think the topic of death comes up a lot. Suicidal ideation is huge, and especially when times get tough. Uh, many of us can have thoughts about, you know, wanting to end our life. Um, so death in a lot of ways kind of gets like a, a really negative, a really bad rap. But, um, you know, thinking about things like, uh, for me, personally, a bucket list, right? And looking at knowing that the end is coming and using that as a motivational tool to get me off my butt today to get out here and do like a podcast, for example, rather than be like, oh, I'll get around to that sometime. You know, we never know how much time we're going to have, but recognizing that our time is finite and trying to make the most of it by recognizing that it does have an end, I think can be a huge motivational factor if we allow it, but it takes a real honest look at, you know, what it means to be mortal here. So I think it's an interesting topic and hopefully fruitful for your discussion here. Yeah, there's different angles to really look at when you're trying to utilize death constructively. I think it's, like Kevin mentioned, it's important to understand that we have a finite amount of time. And although we all hope to live long and healthy lives, we don't actually know what exactly is going to happen and how things will play out. And coming to terms with our own mortality is very important as I think it lends itself to just accepting that, you know, we like life is limited to the present time. And although I think a lot of people try to plan out their lives and have plans for the future, I think it can really push an individual to adhere to the moment and the present and I think it can lead to a person to practice a lot better mindfulness than kind of what we're used to. I think we're all raised to think uh, futuristically and to always be planning ahead, which is interesting, actually, when you kind of start breaking it down and just very briefly going quickly over my entire childhood, right? They ask you, what do you want to do when you want to be, you know, when you're older? Like, what kind of career path do you want to have? But unfortunately, not all children have the opportunity to grow up and be adults or, you know, be healthy to be able to practice those things. And me, myself, actually, for the longest time, I wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to actually be in the military and I don't have the opportunity to do that, right? Um, I wanted to be also a police officer. And so there's limitations because of, unfortunately, the cards that I was dealt physically that I'm just not able to do certain jobs. And so I think in, in that same way, I came to terms with some of the things that are holding me back, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end to life. And there's a lot of good that can come of it. And I think, you know, a bucket list is a great way to kind of push yourself to live a fulfilling life as best as you possibly can. And I think it's good, you know, we're all going to die. And I mean, I always like to think of it in the sense of, I like to enjoy my life the way that it is. It doesn't mean I'm going to be reckless every single day with my actions and the choices that I make. But ultimately, knowing that I'm a mortal being and I could step out of this house and get hit by a car or God knows a piece of a plane or part falls on my head and I'm dead, right? Like it's, it is what it is at, at this point. It's just worrying about death uh, and letting it create anxiety within you is actually not going to lead you to feel like you're living a fulfilling life. It's powerful that you guys seem to have developed this understanding around death, I'd say quite some time ago. For me, it's been a very recent development where I've had a little bit more peace around that. And I know we've talked about this on a previous episode, but I'll mention it again here. This idea of memento mori that the Stoics talk a lot about. Remember, you are mortal. When I first encountered this, I was like, hmm. I don't really know how helpful that's going to be for me because that's my problem or it was my problem was that I was always thinking about, am I going to have enough time to achieve what I want to do? And that was always a fear that was so rooted in me, even from childhood, where I was like, 
I don't know if I go to bed tonight, if I'm going to wake up. And I, that would actually keep me up. And it was keeping me up for a period of time, even as a kid. And as I got a little bit older and started having more agency in my life, I would say that that reduced because my worry was that I wouldn't get to a place where I have complete agency over my own life in terms of access to my own resources, the ability to do what it is that I wanted to do while not being expected to, let's say, obey the rules of my parents, because that was a huge issue for me growing up. And as I started stepping into that role where I had a little bit more agency, where I had the ability to decide what it was that I wanted to achieve and how I wanted to spend my time, and then I was introduced to this idea of momentum mori and started realizing that ultimately speaking, me worrying about how things is going to go does not do anything other than rob me of the joy of the present moment. And if I ultimately want to be able to live a life that's fulfilling, what I need to aim to do, at least for myself, is to spend my day in such a way that if it were my last, I could say at least I was moving in the direction that I wanted to go in. And that has brought me a lot of peace. But because it's still a new I would say mindset, a new perspective that I'm, I've been developing over the last few years. There are times when I am definitely falling back into that. I'd say recently where I, I got sick and then I think I had a bit of pneumonia and in my lung, I was like, oh, this is it's hard to breathe. And then I started worrying about that. I'm like, oh my gosh, is everything okay with me? Like I should go to the doctor, but I'm so busy with work. I don't have time to do all this. And to just see how quickly my mind spiraled back into that, I was like, man, it took me a while before I stopped myself from going down that path, right? This is why, Kevin, when you brought this to us, I was like, you know, this is definitely something that I would enjoy talking about because I know there would be a lot of benefit for me in learning how you came to develop this perspective. And so that's my next question for you is, obviously, this is a well thought out and a nuanced perspective that you've been able to develop, especially knowing you, you're a very thoughtful thinking person. And I know that you learn a lot from what happens around you. If you're open to it, would you mind sharing a little bit with us about how it is or maybe some specific situations or circumstances that happened in your life that helped you develop this viewpoint and mindset that you have of death not being something that we need to fear? I think you, you pick up pieces from everyone, right? Different things and different experiences. And I think that's the important piece is you're always learning, always trying something new because that's what's going to challenge you. Uh, we can be so comfortable, so complacent in terms of just doing the same thing every day, just because it feels comfortable. But um, for me, the bucket list idea where I first kind of came from was actually from a girlfriend that I had in high school. I had a bucket list. I thought it was a pretty cool idea. I was like, you know, thinking that time is ticking. What do I want to do and accomplish in my life? And, you know, first couple of things you put on there um, as, you know, a 15 year old kid, Probably not big dreams, uh, you know, that develop um, over time and pretty vague um, as we're looking at things there. Um, but I think that's a lot of it is, you know, finding out what is important to you, spending time doing that. When we're looking at, you know, that mindfulness piece that you really alluded to. Think of John Lennon when he says, you know, life is what happens when we're busy making other plans. Thinking very much about this idea of like I'm moving in the right direction. Like, but what about like being here? in the moment here. Um, you know, maybe we can't be in the army, but we can wear some nice camo pants. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Still rocking, <laughs> exactly. rocking that look there, Ariel. So uh, again, I think it's about, you know, finding what's important to you. Uh, as I started to develop more of a understanding of psychology in general, ex existential psychology is important. So a lot of existential psychology is about how do we deal with the fact that we are all, all mortal, recognizing that, you know, it's not just the TikTok and all the other different pieces that are coming up. Five second video that makes life meaningful. What actually makes life meaningful for a lot of people are the relationships we have rather than the things that we've, you know, accomplished. We can spend a lot of time trying to like prove ourselves in some way that we're good enough when it's like you look at people who are on their deathbeds and they're looking back and they're reflecting on what's important in them in life. No one's like, ah, you know, I wish I would have got that company up to a million. Yeah. Or I wish I would have spent more time at the office or built my fortune. You can't take it with you. It's the relationships. It's the time you spend with other people that they always allude to. Or the things they wanted to do but never got around to doing. Not from an accomplishment perspective, but it's like, ah, I wish I got away to Paris. Yeah. Um, so for me, knowing that the clock was ticking and kind of having that mindset from an early age, I've been able to really prioritize. And, and again, some things that I thought I'd be really into. I actually um, like the idea of being a pilot myself. 
Um, and then I was super excited. Uh, my uh, wife, a girlfriend at the time, bought me a certificate to go do a flight lesson. I was like, this is exciting. Yeah. I've wanted to do this a long time. Uh, I got up there and assessed that and I'm like, this isn't what I want at all. Yeah. Right. So li- life can be surprising that way. Um, so I, I think, you know, in terms of finding out what's meaningful to you, relationships is a good place to start. But trying new things um, is important. And, and again, just doing your very best to be in the moment because we never know what exists beyond the moment. It's interesting, you know, for for a perspective on death, it's something we don't actually experience. Yeah. Right. It's something that we lose consciousness when we die. Right. Um, we, we don't have a great fear about what happened before we existed. Mm, that's true. But it's a similar kind of experience. There was a non-existence that occurred at that point that we have no fear of. Yeah. But it's just this unknown piece. Now that we do exist, we've got some self-awareness. We're so worried about what the world will be like without us when we're not here anymore. Um, but the world's been around for a lot longer than me. Yeah. Despite uh, how old I feel like I'm getting here. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those are all actually honestly great points. And um, I think I've I've kind of like existentially had like a crisis when I first like lost an eye myself because I think it really painted the picture of, you know, I could go fully blind one day and not be able to look at people or, you know, not be able to look at my loved ones. And it actually instilled a lot of gratitude in me and a lot of appreciation for the world itself. Um, I, I would actually say that that was probably the greatest um, changing point in my life, like the catalyst that led me to really just take life more seriously, generally speaking, and take myself more seriously, take relationships more seriously. Obviously, there's a lot of growth that has taken place since. And, um, but I think I, I kind of hit like a rock bottom place where, yeah, like life completely changes where you sort of realize that you're not as that you're far more vulnerable than you actually believe you are, especially in your youths when you often think like you're indestructible and you can kind of just go along life, not worrying about what could or couldn't happen. And then having to then be worried about, you know, running into things or, you know, protecting your, your own eye and hoping that nothing critical happens. I mean, to me, it could be something as simple as getting into a car crash and, you know, or, running into something by not looking so it's it's been obviously a, a a crazy adjustment and so when i think of of death itself i think to me i've i've thought about it maybe not necessarily in that exact same way but i think about like how my present life would basically die if i went blind because life would not be exactly the same as i have lived it the moment i completely lose my sight and um you know what that would be like. I wouldn't be able to perform my job. I wouldn't be able to perform some of my hobbies or the activities that I enjoy. And uh, I wouldn't be look, be able to look at loved ones. And so I think what you said about when people are under deathbeds, it's such a valuable thing to think about because I think it's rooted in us to tr- sort of chase these goals that society has kind of catered for for us generally to to be chasing. And at the end of the day, when I really generally think about my life, I'm the most fulfilled when I'm having genuine human connections with people and you're actually sharing experiences and you're learning from each other. And I've, I mean, I've said it in multiple episodes about how the fulfilling thing for me is, um, and the thing that I crave the most in life is depth. And I get a lot more depth when I'm able to connect with people And they're able to share the depth that they hold themselves as individuals. And I think that's the most beautiful thing that you can experience just as an individual and as a person. And opening yourself up to that experience is the biggest step towards that. And not having the fear of knowing that, you know, you could be wrong or that maybe somebody else may be smarter than you or somebody who you might think is inferior than you. And just getting rid of all of that and just seeing everybody as they are existentially we are all humans and every human experience is unique and I always think it's just like all we know is limited to just us in our perception of the world and the way that we interact in it 
and, you know, our interpretation of how other people interact and that knowledge in the way that it's shared. And uh, it's always important to open up our ears and even our hearts and souls into actually allowing people to provide us with their experience and just leaving it at that, accepting it that that's their experience. We have our own experience and not being judgmental. And, and that's how I think you build great human connections and, and live a fulfilling life so that you don't have to fear death itself. Because, I mean, whenever it comes, if you're on your deathbed and you have that moment of sudden realization where you're like, oh, I, you know, I wish maybe I had hugged my mom a little closer or, you know, I had told my brother I loved him. You know, you don't have those moments of, of regret. Yeah, definitely, man. What you were talking about in the beginning about depth, I think that it's an important piece of this discussion here because one of the things that I've noticed about death in my own life, and people say that something similar about, about weddings, actually, but I found having had to bury my, both my parents and then getting married all within the span of, let's say, two and a bit years, a little under two years, actually, is that those types of situations, they're great clarifiers or rather the term I like is great revealers. Because when we end up in a situation where we're either mourning the loss of somebody or celebrating the union of something new, it really does show you who is really there and those who are there for you where they truly stand. And how I saw that play out was this. In my mind, yeah, I would say I had entertained the idea of like, oh, what's it going to be like when my parents pass away? I never would have imagined it would be as early as it was. But it's definitely a thought, especially with the fears that I had when I was younger. It was definitely a thought that permeated my mind. And I had a clear vision of who I thought would be there in terms of support. And I will say that, yeah, some of the people that I thought would be there were, but a lot of the people, especially the people that I was most expecting people that had been in my life for a very, very, very long time were the ones that were noticeably absent during that time. And that to me highlighted a couple of things. Number one, it highlighted the fact that maybe I didn't, or I valued those individuals more than they perhaps valued me. So that was a great revealer on my own end. But then secondly, it also helps me understand a little bit more about how brief life truly is. Because I myself have always prided myself on my long-term thinking. I feel that one of my greatest strengths is long-term thinking, but that presupposes that we're going to have all this time to execute on these plans. And when that happened, I was like, okay, you know what? It actually doesn't matter how much you plan into the future because tomorrow is not promised, right? And everybody, you hear that so many different ways, but when it hits you in such a real way where For example, my mom hadn't been on a vacation ever since she came to Canada. She was in Canada for like 31 years and never once went on a vacation. We went to the States one time on a Greyhound, actually, to like see our cousins there. And then the only other time that my mom traveled outside of the country, other than that, was for a funeral, probably three, four years before she passed. And that was it. And I was like, okay, you know what? Once I get to a certain place where I have some financial stability. I'm going to take my mom on a nice vacation or allow her to have some, some resources to be able to go and take whoever she wants to, right? Or to do whatever she wanted to do and go wherever she wanted to go. But I kept telling myself that I had to get to a certain place first. And unfortunately, I never had the opportunity to execute on that. And that was a very, it was a big loss for myself, I would say, because I kind of started questioning why didn't I capitalize on the opportunities I did have? In my head, when I thought about it, I wanted to do it in a really big way. I wanted it to be like this grand thing to be like, oh, yeah, you haven't been able to go on vacation for 30 years. And this is like 30 years worth of like vacation that I wanted to treat you to. But because I was so focused on that long term plan, I failed to see what I was able to do in the short term that would have moved me closer towards that. And it was a very painful experience for me. And so that's why when you brought this idea, Kevin, of death being leveraged as a positive force, that's naturally where my head first went is that, A, yes, it is a great revealer. And I'm glad that I have clarity in my life now about which relationships I need to actually sow into. But more so, it's just a reminder that, yeah, you can pride yourself on your long-term thinking and you can plan three, four, five, 10, 20 years out into the future. And I think that we still do need to consider how we can have what we're doing today match up with what we ultimately want to see in the future. But 
What's more important than that is striving to be more present. And this mindfulness piece that both you, you and Uriel have mentioned is critical for that. And that has been another thing that I've been trying to incorporate in my life because I find that when you like to plan in years, then it's the present moment that will suffer the most from that. I have a question for both of you, just with what you were saying. Do you think that based on societal standards that a person can be truly successful as what society would define successful and still be able to live a life where they are present with their loved ones and not be absent in chasing success? It's a good question. I would say that if we're saying that society defines it as the pursuit of things, having more, getting all you can, canning all you can get and sitting on the lid, I would say no. And the reason for that is, let's use this very basic example. I've been picking up a lot of overtime at work recently and I'm like, okay, well, you know, I have some financial goals that I'm looking to reach in the next five to, well, let's say six to 12 months. And because of that, I have been prioritizing work ahead of most other things currently. We chatted last week about how I'm in a season of that right now. And I would say that currently, the way that I'm spending my time, it does not match up with my values because I've heard it said this way that your heart is where your treasure is, right? And the most valuable things that we have on the face of this earth, well, the most valuable thing is time. And then what we as a society value the most, I would say, is resources, money. So if we say that time and money are some of the most valuable resources, one being infinitely more valuable than the other, then the way you spend your time and your money really reveals to you what's important. And I would say based on how I've been spending my time, that's not in alignment with what's actually important to me. What's actually important to me is building my family, right? Striving to become the best version of myself, taking care of myself and creating a community where we can all feel like we're pursuing something worthwhile and empowering each other to do so. So I would say my first answer is no, but I need to think about this a little bit more. Kevin, what are your thoughts? Time and money beyond that, though, I would say one of the most important resources, something we've alluded to is the relationships we have. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, again, uh, people I've had very little contact with have made a big difference on my life, regardless of the amount of time we've had. But, you know, the way that they have expressed themselves or thought about things in a different way has truly influenced me in, in, a, in a big way. So, um, you know, time being valuable, certainly, I think it, I think it is. Um, money to a certain extent is all what it means to you, right? Um, you know, I think about it from a behaviorist perspective where we take it to being a secondary reinforcer. Money's not actually meeting any needs for you. It's a means to an end. And sometimes I think we get caught up in thinking it's the end in and of itself. But if we see it as truly a means to an end, then we got to see where are we spending the resources as Timmy was saying here. So, uh, for me, I, you know, Maybe it's a product of my time um, being a millennial here, but putting in resources towards experiences over materialism has been a big shift in my lifetime based on, you know, comparing myself to my parents where it's like, you got the newest car, you got the newest uh, appliances, then you know you're you're doing okay. So um, for me, it's uh, taking it back to that bucket list idea is about experiences. And again, so it's been interesting how things you'd really think it's like, ah, this is going to add value to my life. And, and sometimes you do it and you're like, this was actually terrible. But each time you do something like that, you find out something about yourself. Um, so I, th- I would say another thing that's really valuable is knowledge. Um, and you gain that knowledge with how you spend the time and how you spend and who you spend it with. So uh, I think when you're looking at that as resources, taking it back to the idea of about success, if society, you're taking it that society is all about materialism and becoming successful financially, is success, is that congruent with being successful based on how you personally define success? I, I think that is going to depend on each individual, honestly. So I just think it's very peculiar about how in society, you know, for most people, I think you receive an education, you then kind of chase post-secondary education or even further knowledge of you've kind of briefly you've spoken about in the hopes of getting a or developing a career that is lucrative enough for you to build the life that you would hope to have or that you dream of having with then the next goal being 
to build a family for which you can provide for. And then the next goal for that is to then be financially in a place where then you can retire to quote unquote, start living life. And so the reason why I ask that is because I think that, I mean, even just to be able to be successful or to be comfortable, even if I could put it that way, financially, there is a lot of your time that has to go towards, you know, making those sacrifices in life to be able to provide for yourself or to even hope to retire comfortably to be able to live life. And I think just bringing it back to understanding our mortality and accepting it and using that positively, um, I really like the notion of the bucket list, like you're saying, and, you know, applying that concept in whichever way you can in your life, because you, you don't have to wait to meet this milestones to start living life. And I think, like you said, like experiences are incredibly important and like who you are experiencing those things with. I totally agree with that. But getting ourselves out of that frame of mind and just like you were saying to me about wishing that you had taken your mother one when a place that you were more financially stable, but, you know, maybe you weren't financially stable and now you wish you had done it, right? And so, I mean, I've had my own fair share of experiences where I wish I'd spent more time with with like my dog when he passed away and instead of like working more or maybe going out and partying, but now that he's gone, you kind of have all of those wishes and desires because I think it really like life and mortality just kind of slaps you across the face and is like, Oh, here you go. This is all you're missing out on. I think it's a good wake up call to just understand that even generally, I think we talked about it last, last week, right on our episode about how, uh, about finding meaning and what is, what is it that we all are here to do, but I think ultimately is just to be good people, to treat people with respect. Um, and then just to be a good neighbor, a good friend, a good coworker, because at the end of the day, like you've mentioned some of the people that maybe you didn't have a stronger relationship with, or you you just met have changed your life significantly. And we don't actually know the impact that we are having on other people and how our behavior or just the way that we are on a day-to-day basis can actually impact the lives of others. You know, I, I would hope that I I have that impact on people as I come across. And we're not perfect and we all, you know, have our moments of, of vulnerability when we make mistakes. But ultimately, I think we just want to be, I would like to be remembered as a person that, you know, treated people fairly, treated people with respect, that was kind to them. And like I said, I haven't been perfect, but it's almost like, It feels like I I need to feel like I need to make up for the mistakes that I've made in the past Uh, because when I'm on my deathbed, I would hope that the thoughts that are crossing through my mind is that, you know, I was good to the people that that surrounded me and that I hope that they think the same thing about me. Yeah. What you're talking about is legacy, right? Like what is it that you leave in people and for people when you're no longer here? I think that when I had some mentors in my life that talked about the importance of considering that, that also kind of helped ease what was then a significant worry in my life about leaving this earth before I wanted, before I accomplished all that I wanted to do. And more so just reframing it to be like, you know what, while I have no control over the day or the hour that that is going to happen, I do have complete control over how I prioritize my time currently, right? And it comes back to what I was talking about earlier with the, with death being a great revealer. I think that the other piece of that is that it really allows you to have a deeper understanding of what is actually truly important, not necessarily just who, but what in terms of how you go ahead to spend your time. Because as we've talked about a couple of times now with this idea of being on your deathbed, I remember the very first time that I saw one of those, it was a Buzzfeed post that was like, Ooh, the top five things or the, Something along the lines of five things that a that the dying regret from a palliative care nurse. I remember the first time it popped up, I was like, ah, I don't think I'm ready for that. Because I didn't want to put myself in that mind state to be like, okay, if I was on my deathbed, are these things that I would regret? But as social media does, it loves to bring things back to your feed and just ensure that you click on things that other people are clicking on so they can get that ad revenue. So it came back up eventually. And when I did read it, I was like, man, I wish I had actually read this sooner because it did bring me a little bit of peace where they were talking about mostly 
and it's very common themes, right? I wish I had spent more time with my loved ones. I wish I had spent less time pursuing resources, pleasure. And I wish that I had followed through on things that I had in my heart, but maybe lacked the courage to actually execute on. And for me, that was actually reassuring because I then had a pathway to actually apply what it was that was previously holding me back to my benefit. And that is that, yeah, you know, I don't want to have to say that. And so today, this is what I'm going to do to move closer. I think an interesting quote that, you know, has always stuck with me and I can't remember who said it, unfortunately. Um, but everyone dies, but not everyone truly lives, right? So much of our time, I think, is spent in fear. What are other people going to think about me? Or what if I go over and travel somewhere and then I lose my wallet? Or is so much time is spent worrying about things that we don't actually live our lives. We spend so much of thinking about what if, and I think those two words really are at the height of anxiety. Yeah. Uh, when we look at, you know, what if this happens? And it's not like, what if I win the lottery? Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, it's always like, oh man, what if this terrible calamity happens, right? Yeah. But, ah, uh, you know, uh, that that's really stuck with me quite a bit. It's like not everyone truly lives. You get to decide every day how you're going to live your life. All of us come from different backgrounds, right? Uh, we're facing different struggles in our, in our life. But um, something that I realize you know, from a therapeutic perspective is like, yeah, a lot of times as kids, we don't get to write our story. It's yeah. dictated by our parents. They tell us how things are going to be, what we're going to eat, who our friends are going to be with to a certain extent. Yeah. It changes as we become teens. But um, some people as they grow into adulthood don't realize they have the pen in their hands. Um, and they're kind of stuck with that same narrative that they had from kids. You know, why do I have to do this? Well, that's what dad would have wanted. Or that's what mom always said. And you know, if you realize that how much power, how much control, how much freedom you have to write the narrative of your own life, um, you know, one thing that I always or try my best to do is, is this an experience that's going to lead to a story? Um, that's something I really value is the narratives that we develop in our lives. And if we get to a place where it's like, you know, did I tell you about the time I almost did that? I already you've lost me in terms of the story, right? So I think being able to take chances, do something outside the norm not only gives us information about um, what we enjoy, but who we are as people, right? And what some of our limitations are, but also what some of our strengths are when we push through things that those are boundaries that we had set for ourselves, but we really recognize that it's like, oh man, I could do that. And then you move on to the next step. So I I think the importance of, you know, taking time to take chances and, and truly live because again, everyone dies. That's where we're at. Yeah. But if you don't take the time to live, that's the most wasteful. That's the real tragedy, I think, of the human experience. I, I don't know why I just kept thinking, and I, I don't know who said this as well, but it's like nobody ever remembers the things that you say, but they always will remember the way that you make them feel. Yeah. And, um, and I th- oh, I, I know why I was thinking about it, because you're saying about how people always worry about, you know, how other people see them and stuff. And I, that was something I struggled with very significantly for a large part of my life um, until I kind of just led my life by the thought of like treating others in the same way that I'd like to be treated. And then I stopped questioning whether or not, you know, people thought these things about me. And I just kind of made it my goal to treat people in the same way that I would like to be treated, regardless of what the situation is. And then it kind of cut that thing out of, out of it. And that, that anxious perspective of feeling like, you know, I need to impress these people or I need to make them think this type of way. And it actually is such a freeing thing and it makes you live. But also I found that it it is, it almost opens up these new doors where you actually are able to take interest in people and then build these experiences with people and you develop more authentic and um, deeper relationships with, uh, with other people because you're more open and willing to be vulnerable in, in different ways. And more authentic, right? Because you, you're not afraid to just being who you are and you understand that, you know, not everyone's going to like you. Not everybody's going to see the way that you, you see it. Uh, but more importantly is just taking the chances, like you said. Um, and that was something that I always struggled with as a kid. Growing up with five brothers, you know, being the youngest one, I was always the one that got picked on. So it was almost like I always had to kind of fight the uphill battle. but. Um, yeah, it's such a liberating experience and just bringing it back down to 
you know, death and the human experience in regards to that is like, you, like you said about holding onto that pen and writing our own story and, and stop following, you know, what society or what our family wants or maybe what our friends want for us. And it's just writing your own story because at the end of the day, when we're on our deathbeds, if we even get the chance to do that, like, you know, be proud of whatever it was that you achieved and you lived the life that you wanted to live, whatever way, you know, that took. Um, because, yeah, that's also, I think, something that I, like, held close to my heart. My parents were always like, oh, you're going to do great things. I feel like everyone's parents say that, but, right. Right. <laughs> but you know, it's like, and then it kind of sets you up for failure, really, in a way, because you, you have these expectations of, of your parents. They're not yours, right? Like these dreams and hopes of your parents for you to be whatever it is that they want you to be. But then when you're like, you know what? I don't really want to be, you know, a doctor and, and, lawyer. and a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I have personal experience with that one. <laughs> yeah, but it's so liberating to just, you know, live your life in that way. And it was so funny because I think my two of my brothers, like very much, um, I, I love them to death, but. They're very inspired by like my father and they very much followed almost like in the footsteps of what they, what my what I, I perceive my father wanted for them. And I, I see those, like how they revert back to those roles, right. In the family. Um, and I, I'm kind of just like, I used to be that way, but now I'm just this like, um, wild horse, I guess. And like, I'm not tamed anymore. And I see how even in my relationship with my father, who I love dearly, how he like wants to tame me back just because he has that with my other siblings. But I'm just kind of like, you know, I've, I've built those healthy boundaries and, and, and developed that relationship with him in that way. But I didn't feel like I was living a fulfilling life, you know, when I was living that way. And so I think I really, that what you said really resonated with me a lot when I just kind of took control of my own life and started to expose myself. And even just doing something like this, a podcast, right? Yeah. Um, just me physically, I had a lot of anxiety around my eye, like being in front of a camera. What are people going to think? How are people going to judge me? I mean, I had a lot of fear even just looking at people like in their eyes because I was like, oh, they're going to see that. Maybe I have a lazy eye or, or whatever. And I mean, I get comments like that made all the time. But then it's almost like exposure therapy, you know? It's like you just expose yourself to something and then it no longer has that effect on you. And so... Yeah, I do. I do believe in that. It's such a powerful thing when you sort of just allow yourself to expose yourself to things that you're like, hey, you know what? Maybe I like this. Maybe I don't. And so, yeah, that's some powerful stuff, Kevin. For sure. And the theme that I kind of heard throughout to try to bring this and tie it in a nice bow is that a lot of this stuff starts in childhood. And depending on how you were raised, the environment you were raised in, maybe your parents' beliefs around things such as death, you start to develop these internal dialogues and these stories about how that plays out. And so something that I know all three of us have in common is that we do want to have kids in, in the future. And so I'm curious to ask you guys, well, I want to ask you guys this question to, as kind of a concluding thought. What do you guys think will be your first lesson to your children or child about death. I don't know. I don't think I have an answer for that. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's an interesting one that just popped in my head. Kevin, is that something you I got an answer? All right. Let's hear it. <laughs> let's hear it. I think kids have a natural curiosity about them. They're going to be curious about yeah. death because they're going to come across roadkill or yeah. they're going to come across a cartoon yeah. or a grandma's going to pass away or a pet's going to pass away. I yeah. Life, if there's anything that's guaranteed in this life, they say death, death and taxes, taxes, right? So <laughs> death is going to present itself. I, I, yeah. I think it's just meeting your child where they're at, that's, right? They're going to come there with that curiosity about having an honest, open discussion, but at the level that the child can understand, right? Um, they're going to have questions about it. They're going to be curious naturally about all things in the world. Death is another one of those things. It's going to show up for them at some point yeah. anyway. I think there's a lot of approaches, a lot of damage that can be done by just trying to hide death. Yeah. Right. Um, but if we talk about it, you know, mommy and daddy, yeah, someday they're going to pass away. Not for a long time though. We're going to be here to protect you. We're going to help you grow. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's something that is going to happen to all of us eventually, but we get this wonderful experience to exist on this planet. Uh, just taking a moment to recognize how strange existence is, right? Yeah. 
Um, you know, you take it to the level of space and we're on a planet soaring through a universe that's ever expanding. Yeah. Right. And uh, we're so focused in on a little device to yeah. the time, right? Yeah. So um, I, I, I think life finds a way to present us with opportunities to have these discussions. The importance, I think, uh, as a parent is showing up for those discussions, not necessarily having the answers, who does, yeah. but being able to meet the kids where they're at and talk them through that experience in an open, honest way based on their level. Yeah. Yeah. Love it, man. Open and honest, the themes of this show. But I love how we we're just talking about like experience. And I think that that word keeps coming up. Yeah. Right. And because I think the human experience, right. And we just kind of forget that it's, yeah, that's the most important thing. Yeah. And I really like what you said about answers. I think as a kid, I always thought about like, I, you, I always had to have an answer. And I think we've talked about that yeah. before, oh, yeah. about always asking the whys. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think like, that was also like one thing that I think held me back along a lot in my life. Like, why do we exist? Why, you know, what is the role of you? And I think sometimes it still kind of stems me. But instead, just like you said, instead of like, just focus on like the people that are in front of you. Yeah. Um, I forget that sometimes. And, you know, I think we need to give ourselves constant reminders of that because we take that for granted. We take human life for granted, I think. Yeah. Honestly, less greed, more generosity. Generosity. I like it. Thanks for tuning into today's episode, guys. Kevin, appreciate you coming through, man. This was was dope. And so we're definitely going to have to have you come on for round two and we can uh, see you dive fearlessly into closest again. (laughs) That was was good, man. Excellent. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it, guys. Of course, man. Yeah. Thanks for listening, guys. Stay blessed.